Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 33rd edition of In the Mix from the Six. As big always, three. oh yeah, big three three. We're upgrading, man. I got Addis Kuchkovich here, and uh, my name is yeah. Jay Boyle. And I hope your quarantines have been going well. There's rumors here in Ontario that uh, Ford may lighten up some stuff on Thursday. Um, but he also extended the emergency order till June 2nd. So who knows? Yeah, no, I was going to say, I don't think it's going to change much. I don't know. I got family members saying that he's announcing that you can have up to 10 people in a workplace tomorrow. And I'm like, I think that's false news. Even when they open that up, though, then like 10 people in a workplace, can you function like that? Depending, on, you depending work, on the workplace. If you work retail, you can't have freaking consumer like customers and stuff in there. So no, but for example, I work I work in a hockey store. If you only if there's a ten person cap, you could have only literally two or three employees and then just let yeah. in a couple customers at a time. And there's but then you would need security, no? No, you're gonna stop twenty You just, you just need <laughs> you just need Jay Boyle at your door, that's all. <laughs> Screaming. Trust me, if that happens, I'll be the one posted at the door. Hundred percent they'll have me there. <laughs> pay you for that that'd be sick dude saturdays at close when it hits five o'clock and there's still customers in the store and obviously people are going to try and come in as soon as it hits yeah. five manager goes jay door i'm at that door <laughs> <laughs> no, I i'm the one who's not gonna let people in that door i want to go home my day is done no but i feel like people are disciplined enough that they won't be fucking around even if they do open shit up oh if they do they're out of my like... line <laughs> 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 so all right so even though we're at a slow, slow time of sports news, we do have some stuff. The, la- the Last Dance has continued. Episodes 7 and 8 have been released. And we're gearing yep. up for the series finale with episodes 9 and 10. <laughs> this Sunday. As if we state. don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> hey, you Who never wins? know. You never know. Uh, gearing up for Jordan's <laughs> second retirement probably as well. And uh, oh, yeah. Kendrick Perkins has been releasing his top fives of almost every basketball category in the world. Some I agree with, some I don't. But he put out a debate on uh, Instagram or Twitter uh, pitting Paul George versus Pascal Siakam. And he said, who would you rather have at this time? So we're going to debate that as well. Then we'll get into some COVID-19 talk. This might have flown over your head tops. But uh, Kevin Durant was in an interesting phone call he was involved in. And that may lead people to believe, especially me, that maybe he is potentially returning for a playoff run with the Nets. We'll get into that. Uh, we'll wrap up UFC 249. You've digested it. Um, we'll more Finally talk- had some sports with us. Finally. Man. We'll talk about kind of the, the fights that happened, but what, what do those mean for the UFC going forward? And yeah. especially for Conor McGregor, who popped off on Twitter once again. It's been a while since I got a Conor Twitter rant. So I'm happy we got yeah. that. And the, <laughs> N- and the NHL team, uh, NHL, as a 2014 proposed playoff format. So we'll discuss all of that, starting off with the last dance. What was the biggest part of the last dance, episode seven and eight for you, Mr. Kuchko? We talked about earlier. This is uh, probably only aimed at number episode seven, but it was uh, Jordan releasing his uh, frustrations when talking about his uh, mentality when playing basketball. Like we were talking about, I can't believe the guy got emotional talking about having a having basically a mama mentality or you know like that type of like how do you get emotional over that? Like that's mm-hmm. what I, my initial thought was. But then I'm like, yo, you got to think about like what the, like what basketball means to this guy. You know when they were saying like he doesn't want to attack social issues and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. He was basketball oriented the day he dies. <laughs> you know like yeah. it was like, yo, I'm here to win, and if you guys aren't with me, like you know just leave basically. Yeah, so it was, it was end of episode seven, and it just, like, it really caught me where I was like, whoa, what he was talking about. He was talking about the yeah. price that he paid of winning, right? And then he goes into, uh, and how he treated his teammates. And he goes, and I earned that right because my teammates came after me. They didn't endure all the things I endured. Once you joined the team, you lived at a certain standard that I played the game at. And I wasn't going to take anything less. Now, if that means I had to go in there and get in your ass a little bit, then I did that. So that part was great and then he goes into you ask all my teammates one thing about michael jordan was he never asked me to do something that he didn't fucking do when people see this they're gonna say well (laughs) he wasn't really a nice guy he may have been a tyrant well that's you because you never won anything i wanted to win but i wanted them to win and be a part of that as well to him winning was the only thing relevant in his life nothing else mattered even when he was filming uh space jam 
It was how do I continue being great? Oh. And after that loss to Orlando, <laughs> right? And he makes he sells I, I, I need a court and I need a gym. And yeah. he, he gets all the best players in the world to come <laughs> through so he can how? scout them and test his That's own crazy. game. And he did whatever it took, paid any price to elevate himself after that Orlando Magic loss. And that's what he was talking about there. And I think the reason why he got emotional is because some people don't understand the price he paid and don't understand his mentality. I think that's hard for him to grasp with, that people don't understand why maybe he was an asshole. Well, not maybe, he was an ass. But it's because he was really trying to make his teammates as good as he possibly could. And Kobe Bryant did the same thing. We've often heard times where... You know, he's beefing with teammates in practice and stuff, oh, yeah. too, calling them trash. But that's why I feel like it separates, like, what a coach is and then what leadership of, like, you know, your play, your top player is. You know, when they they even talk about it with it, Kobe, LeBron, like, they're calling them coaches. What they're showing is leadership, you know? Like, it's like if, yeah. you, like, if I think you're not playing at your best, I'm – they all did it in different ways, but the way Jordan was doing I'm going to be on your ass every single day. Yeah. Like, he, what was that player he was doing it on? Bur- Burnell or something? I can't remember his first his name for some reason. BJ Armstrong? No, no, no. There's that one player that he was like, I har- harass. Oh, was- Scotty, Scotty Burrell. Burrell, yeah, yeah. And, like, you know, guys like that, but you're going to get the best out of them because there's that type of leadership on the team, you know? Yeah. So I feel like I kind of got to see the separation between what someone like Phil Jackson can do for your team but then what having a guy like Jordan does for your team as well. Yeah. You know? Or you can't just be like, oh, the coaching was great. As all of the players said in the doc, right, whether it's Horace Grant, Scotty Burrell, Scotty Pippen, um, yeah. uh, Bill Wellington or Wennington, I forget his name. Wellington. They all said, yeah, and in the moment, <laughs> it, you're pissed off and maybe you're upset at Mike, but looking yeah. back on it, it was the best thing you possibly did. And I think – Listen, I don't think Mike wanted to be the biggest asshole on the planet. And I think that's why he was getting emotional. But he knew yeah. he had to be that way to help his team get to the ultimate goal of winning those chips. And look, he did. Because when it showed the one year that, that they were playing without him, they almost made it to the finals. They got eliminated yeah. by New York, right? But, yep. like, the team was still great without him. I yeah. feel like a lot of that they came had a, from they had a everything they learned. Season. Exactly. And I feel like a lot of that came from, you know, what they learned playing with them, that they carry that type of, like, momentum and, like, motivation to keep working, even without them. Mm-hmm. So it just shows what, what kind of impact not just having a great coach can have, but, like, a player with, like, great leadership skills. Well, I think the difference is if a coach acts that way, you don't see the coach. You're not doing court. it with me, right? Yeah, exactly. you're not seeing him doing that work on the court, in the gym, yeah. in the film room, and it just turns out to – you know, like a Leafs Mike Babcock situation. You think your coach is an ass and you just don't like your coach. When it comes from a player who's setting that example each and every day in and out, it, yeah. it motivates you a lot more than whether when it's a coach doing it. And that's why coaches, the greats, they always talk about a lot of it. Their greatness is due to the leadership group on each individual team and the work that they wanted to put in. Exactly. Because like you said, the guy... I didn't ask any of those guys to do anything that I'm not doing myself. Yeah. Exactly. So it's like, you know, you want to be as good as me and win championship, then do exactly the same. Yeah, it's, it's similar stuff I try to tell my men's ball hockey team, but somehow they don't get it. <laughs> okay, Jordan. I'm hoping they're watching this documentary, you know. This is why I'm so tough on them. I want to elevate them to great heights. Have you guys won a championship yet? No, we're trying to get there, but they don't listen. They don't listen. I've won championships without them in other phases of my hockey career. Ball hockey? No, because ball hockey, I've been it's with the same team. It's a different sport, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different sport. Yeah, ice hockey, champ- ice hockey, I was in that. I could put the team on my back, you know? Fair enough, yeah. But different listen, sport, go- goaltending is not our problem in ball hockey. <laughs> but hey, <laughs> listen. Can you your team now? No, no, but listen, before, before this COVID, like, <laughs> I, I feel for guys like LeBron James. Uh, a team like Tampa Bay, Boston, who are having great seasons in the sports. Because, dude, even, even, like, I'm pissed off even about our men's ball hockey team. Where are we going to finish? This is our season. We're going to finish top three in the regular season. My little, my little brother's, uh, you know, ice hockey team. They were number one all season. They were unbeaten. That's, like, in minor hockey, they, they were unbeaten. I think they have one or two yeah. ties. No losses in the whole regular season. Playoffs were just about to start. 
And the kid hasn't won a chip and, since he was like eight years old, and now he's 15. He's finally going to probably win again. Season's canceled. So but I feel the thing I feel is, for athletes everywhere. You feel for athletes, but this also shows that the reason that a guy like LeBron James is where he's at is because he carries the same mentality you like you just said you are because you're not getting paid to play, right? Yeah. So like he still carries that and he's still getting paid, but yeah. he's still acting as if you know he ain't getting paid. He's just a love he, for he the game. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Now, one thing I want to talk about. Uh, this is a, t- a tougher topic to dissect in the documentary. So Jordan retired three times in his career. Yeah. Right. And the first one, everybody talks about how after 93 and 98, he looked the same. He was so burnt out. 93, he, he had told the reporter before the Dream Team 92 said, uh, you know, I'm going to shock the world. I'm going to retire and go play, quit and go play baseball. But I got to do the Dream Team first, got to the Olympics. And, and, you know, Larry hasn't won three. Magic hasn't won three. I got to win three straight. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's, you don't question, like, the love of the game is the work ethic. How does a guy who's highly renowned as the best player in the world get so tired of the game twice to retire and then needs a break and then come back? And I'm not taking shots at Jordan. I'm just, you know, I don't like the GOAT debate, but I like, you know, just dissecting yeah. players and their styles, their mentalities. Then you look mm-hmm. at a guy like LeBron James, and I think, again, you commend him for going to nine straight finals or eight straight finals and never yeah. needing a break, never tiring, never wavering. And Michael Jordan arguably the greatest of all time, needed two extended breaks in his career. But he even said, though, it wasn't basketball that took him out of playing. It was what was going on with the media. Like, you see that, that one part was so despicable. It was, like, disgusting to me. But they started blaming his father's death on him. On him and yeah, his, but uh, that, that, that's addiction. a... Okay, I want to touch on that quick, if you don't... But I'll let you finish your yeah. point. But uh, I'm thinking of stuff like that, where it was like, I'm here to play, like, why is everything that I'm doing now like being broadcasted but like people ain't talking about oh he just won three championships in a row you know but now yeah. they want to talk about oh he has a gambling problem his dad died it's probably because of that it's like what the, the media doesn't focus on the actual sports it's oftentimes enough after a basketball exactly. or a hockey game where you see a guy be like you want to talk about the game then I'll answer your questions if not I'm out right yeah. and that's a conversation we had last last week where it's Okay, Jordan got so tired of the media, it forced him out of the game. He wouldn't, by that standard, he wouldn't survive in today's world, in this era. But just what I want to talk about quickly, the situation which is with his father's tragic passing and the lines drawn between his gambling addiction addiction, and then him, uh, that secret what suspension for that? 18 months. Yeah. The way they dismissed that in the documentary, I didn't like. I've done a lot of research on this uh, about a year ago. Listened to podcasts on it, did my own research. Yeah. I don't believe it to be true, but you can draw those lines. There's lots of information out there to say those are valid lines to draw in a connection between Michael Jordan's gambling, his father's death, and his suspension. I don't believe them, but I'm saying those facts are there. And if you do the research on them, I would have to go back to my notes. I should have prepared it for this episode. But you could yeah. make a case and say, huh, that is interesting. But then there's all the evidence that dismisses all of it. But there's yeah. a lot out there that makes you think, you know what? But is that that's why is that, that big of a coincidence? And the documentary again, it's Michael Jordan propaganda. You gotta re, you gotta remember, right? And they're not gonna explore yeah. both sides of the story. There, they just dismiss it and make the media look like like garbage for investigating a valid storyline. But I, like the reason it became a story is because there were lines to be drawn. That like on yeah the, yeah no, uh, no, no that's what I'm saying. saying and there's connection, but it was there. That's why it became like such a big thing. But yeah, it was all, like, at the same time, as a journalist, it was like this guy is mourning like one of the worst things that could have happened to him, and like yeah. all these like I can see where that would push you away from the game because it was like, holy shit! Like what else do I have to do? You know? So I just won yeah, three but, championships in a row. And we're still the, talking about here's the family, thing, though. You know, his father passed away after yeah. the third championship, after the '93 title. Mm-hmm. He had decided he was going to leave basketball before that. It wasn't that that got him out of there. 92 summer, you told the reporter, after this season, after I went three, I'm quitting to go play baseball and going to yeah. go play baseball. He had decided that already. He was already fed up with the media and tired of basketball. Yeah. So that, that was not the deciding factor. And what I'm saying yeah. is that the, I just didn't like the way that the documentary kind of – they pick and choose their storylines. They don't really give you both sides as reporters, and the documentary really should, in my opinion. Yeah. Well – 
But also, like, what I took from it is how impressive it is what LeBron's done. You said this earlier, like, this guy, what, 16 years? And he's still freaking – he's never said he's gotten tired of He's never even thought of retirement. He doesn't take a break. This guy's playing every game almost. Like, it's insane. This guy yeah. suffered his first injury in his, what, 16th year? 15th year? Like, what? Yeah, first you know, it's, it's madness. Yeah. And it's the first time he's missed that, like, what, that, that many games? Yeah. Insane. Um. Well, I, the last topic we'll kind of discuss last dance. Coming up, coming out of that first retirement, fifth game, 55 points. How blown yeah. away were you by that? And did you know how well he played so quickly? Obviously, his first game, he sucked. That there's a lot <laughs> going on there. But, yeah. And then to weld him into the, into the playoffs and then lose to the Magic. But he still – we were talking about, you know, this past end of offseason, guy like Le'Veon Bell who missed the season. How good would he be? Antonio Brown, you miss all the time. Could you, how good are you really going to be? Probably not that good. Yeah. Le'Veon Bell struggled throughout the whole season. And then this guy, Michael Jordan, the audacity of this guy to just walk in and drop 55 his fifth game back after 18 months playing baseball. He's outlier of all outliers, bro. That's insane. To be learning a new sport and then go back to your old sport and at play like you haven't missed a beat is insane to me. Because I, I didn't think it was like that direct. Like I knew he went to go play because this was before I was even born. I knew yeah. he went to go play baseball and stuff. But I didn't think that halfway through NBA season, this guy's, oh, I'm, go- I'm coming back to basketball. Like, More than like after, <laughs> yeah, after doing all of that training to become a baseball player, and be, and like he said, have his body be a baseball body and not like built for basketball. And yeah. then he comes back and he compete with. Did he go game seven with the uh, Magic? Uh, six or seven, I can't remember. Either way, six or seven to go to the finals. It's, it's madness. Oh, wasn't that the second round? Hmm. That was the Eastern Conference final. Oh. Yeah, and just the body transformation we talked about briefly before we recorded, right? Baseball players playing the outfield, you're going to be a lot slimmer so you can move quicker. Uh, your yeah. arm, you, if most outfielders, is a little bit slimmer than what a basketball player is going to be and, and try and be jacked. So just that old transformation. And they hit it on the nose there, right? You didn't have the gas coming into uh, the playoffs. That's as well, well, baseball, you don't need the same cardio. <laughs> you don't need the same yeah. cardio in baseball, right? Of course, yeah. And uh, I, just, I just wonder, it made me wonder. Terry Francona said it, and he's now a you know, major league manager. He's, he's won a World Series. He said if Jordan got 1,500 at-bats, he'd find his way into the big leagues. So it makes you wonder, if there was never that strike in 1993, one, would the, yeah. Montreal, would the Montreal Expos have won the World Series? I think they would have. Uh, number two, would Michael Jordan have ever gone back to basketball? I think he still would have gone to basketball because even when, when? He did his reti- when, when he did his retirement speech, he did, like, if I still want to come back, I'll come back. I yeah, think but that was, league, that was contingent you know, on him years. failing in baseball, right? And like I said, Terry Francona believed, who was his manager in double-A, if he had 1,500 at-bats, he would have found his way to the big league. So the if he had league, made, yeah. made the major leagues, I don't think you ever see the second 3 P. So crazy. Chica- crazy. Chica- Bro, why, would, why would he leave if he makes bas- major league baseball? Bro, basketball is in his blood. If he yeah, made but, the major leagues... He would have played probably a season, and just suddenly that basketball started coming up to him, and he he falls yep. out of love with baseball. All right, you just froze it's there, gonna, so I have no idea what you said. But oh, sorry. Well, I said even if he played one year in major league, yeah. that basketball motivation and mental is gonna start building up, and he's going to go back to basketball. It, it's it, he's like he said. He was brought onto this earth to play basketball. I feel like regardless but, of what, what happened that year, he would have gone back to basketball. Yet, his childhood dream and his father's dream, who he was living for at that time was his father who had just passed, was to yes. play in the majors. Okay? And after yes. his 13-game hitting streak came to an end, and you saw the off-speed stuff was giving him lots of trouble, what did he do? Mm-hmm. He was having batting practice at 7 a.m. before Team BP. Then takes Team BP plays in the game, and then he takes BP afterwards. Most guys will maybe hit a little bit before regular BP, which is a team BP before a game. He was doing four extra batting sessions a day. He was in the grind, and then he started figuring out. <laughs> he had 50 RBIs in not even a full season. And if he had made the major leagues, and that was his childhood dream, and he's having lots of fun, and the pressure's not on him with the media because he's not the MJ of baseball as he was the MJ yeah. of basketball, 
he could have been very happy. Maybe he would have returned to basketball at some point, like he did at the end with, with Washington, just as a cap off from going back to ball. But if he's just having that success been. in baseball and he's on a good team and his team's going on playoff runs, what's yeah. to say he, he, he was that as committed to baseball for that short period of time as he was to basketball? He was but grinding it out. I know. The but only reason like... why he ended up in that practice gym because he went for bre- to breakfast with the teammate because there was no baseball. <laughs> but, bro, listen. His – okay, where he was at his career, wait, 31, starting baseball? Yeah. He knew that there was no chance of him becoming one of the best baseball players ever. No, I, I don't think he wanted to be one of the best. He just, no, his no, goal but was I'm to make saying, the majors, live out his childhood yeah. dream and his father's dream. So I, that's what I'm saying right here with this, is once you make it to the major leagues, what else is there for you to prove? You no, made he still it, you wants to win and perform. It's yeah, the fire burning inside of you. He ain't winning no. He ain't gonna. He's not gonna be the determining factor of winning a championship. No, if you make the major leagues, yes, you could. Even if you're a guy who hits two, Jordan, you're telling seven. Jordan at what thirty-two is gonna make a difference to a baseball team win them a championship. Jose Batista at thirty-two was belting fifty home runs a season. Not saying Jordan was gonna do After that. Playing his whole life, Jose, I'm saying. Yeah, but Jose Batista, he turned his career around in his late twenties, early thirties. After playing his whole life, he didn't have another yeah, sport sure. he was committed to. I guess, but Jordan played up until 17. He yeah. had that natural ability, God-given talent in baseball as well, right? And yeah. it's like riding a bike. You hop back on it. I'm telling you, you get to the major leagues, you cannot say for a fact that – or he, he, may, he probably would have gone back, but it wouldn't have been that quick. He wouldn't have won again would've in 96 because yeah. he would have been in the major league baseball. I so, think he would have been back by 96, 7. <laughs> Eight, nine. <laughs> you don't know if this. Bro, hundred percent. Jordan's right now saucing man's on the court still. At what fifty? No, he's not. Basketball he, he said he barely blood, touches bro. the court. He barely oh, touches the court. <laughs> no, you are. You, see, you ever see that where uh, he was at a he was at a school? He said if Jordan misses a yeah, shot, yeah, yeah. he's gonna give the whole school free Jordan. The man did not miss a shot. That guy's not missed a beat, bro, in shooting. <laughs> yeah. Listen, here's the thing. Banging so, threes, though. So that was... Uh, n- what? Yeah, so 93, he left to go play baseball, right? Yeah. The following season, so after... I guess this would have been the strike. The White Sox were a good team, 67 and 46. First in their division, right? Playoff <laughs> run. Let's check. 1995. 68 and 76. Finished with the uh, good enough for third place in the American League Central. Bro, did you see him in the locker room watching the Chicago Bulls game? Well, yeah, obviously, he, he, he's still friends he with those Chicago guys. If he saw Chicago lose it for one more year, he was back to basketball. That guy was dead if, if he, <laughs> still watching okay. freaking Chicago, Chicago I Bulls I think game. if the strike never happened, he would have entered baseball again the following season. And then maybe, if he still wasn't in the majors by 95 yeah. and saw the Bulls lose again, he perhaps probably would have gone back. But I'm just saying, it's crazy to think about if there was no strike, he may have never returned or would have returned way later. You may not have seen that second three-peat. Yeah. I didn't even know that that was a reason that he left baseball because of the strike. Yeah, I thought it was after the season he just went back. I didn't put two and two together. I I knew Montreal Expos were supposed to win that year. They didn't because of the strike. Um, Yeah. Crazy, crazy to think about Michael Jordan's career and so what did they, how so what did they do? Just the scrap that season? Just yeah, yeah. If I'm not, if I'm so not, they just scrapped the baseball season. If I'm not mistaken, just the whole season was wiped. Like this season might be in all of sports. Possibly. I was gonna say, yeah, possibly this, this could happen this year, no? Yeah, who knows? Uh, yeah, first blah 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 blah. Yeah, they did but, uh, not. But uh, <laughs> you know more about baseball than I do. How good was he actually? He was based on his. Like, I don't even know what those stats mean. Here's the thing: everybody's surprised that he was hitting 202 in Double A, yeah. right? 202 in Double A is not that good by any means of the imagination. But for him to be hitting 202 after not playing baseball from when he was 17 to 31, that's impressive. But in general, it's not good. No, for to get promoted from Double A AA to Triple A, he would have had to have been hitting probably 275, 280 at the minimum. So from 20% average to a 27, 28. And then you can make the jump to AAA. And then AAA, again, if you're hitting 270, 280, you could potentially get a sniff at the majors. But just the way that he was able to progress that quick from, okay, yeah. I had a great, 
good 13 game winning streak. League, yeah. And then after that streak, put in the work to figure out the off-speed stuff. And 50 RBIs, is, is <laughs> that's not a small number. Yeah. 50 runs batted in. But, but uh, I don't know. I get, with his mentality, I can believe it. That he, he probably would have made it to the league. That's what I'm saying. What that uh, means for his basketball career, I don't well, think it changes. We'll never that. find out, and we'll wrap this segment <laughs> right there. All right, Mr. Kendrick Perkins. This guy's been making waves on the internet. Um, we're just going to disregard. Yes, he always does. We're just going to disregard a bunch of stuff he said, except the one that caught our eye. <laughs> the one that caught our eye had to do with the Toronto Raptors, obviously. And I think yeah. it was a very good posed question by Perkins. Paul George started off his career tremendously, was one of the best players in the Eastern Conference, perennial all-star, still is. Uh, in Indiana, made his move to yeah. Oklahoma. Now he's with uh, Kawhi Leonard in LA. And he posed him against Pascal Siakam, the most improved player of last season, who again couldn't make a case to win most improved player again as he's gone from 17 points a game to 23.6, number one scoring option on the second seed Toronto Raptors in the East. I'll let you take it off if yeah. you like. Who would you rather take? <laughs> Who yeah, would you rather start, take? Okay. I can start it if you want. <laughs> no, no, I'll start, I'll start. We're debating. Who would you rather have on your team today? You're trying to win ball games. Go. All right. Well, where I'm going with this is it depends what you need. Because okay. there, there's no wrong answer here. Because you choose either I guy. There's a wrong great. answer. They're both great. You choose either guy. They're both great. If you're looking for a guy that's going to lead your team in everything, like he's going to be your number one option, he's your best player, he's going to lead your team to a finals hopefully you gotta go with Paul George here if you're choosing a guy and you have a good team and you have maybe another star on the team you go with Siakam I can understand that but if you're building your team with a bunch of scrubs and you need one of these two we'll you're choosing Paul George here so I'm that- saying I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a scenario here I'm saying you got so scrubs now you're picking and choosing and your scenarios to, yeah All right. <laughs> you, you already got- lost <laughs> You're trying to build a team without much, and you need a star who's mm-hmm. going to lead your team to the promised land. They go with Paul George here. Because, again, Why? as I've said, Why? What, what you're basing on with Siakam leading a team is on hope. No. With George, I've seen proof. I have not seen proof of Siakam leading a team to anywhere past a first round of the playoffs. When has he oh. led a team by himself to a playoff? To a, sorry, this to a is, playoff game. This is the first year that he's led a team. So exactly. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, with Siakam, what you're basing it off of is hope that he continues the way he's been playing throughout the season, and he's able to win the games in the playoffs. Okay, now, when so. we're talking about Paul George, two. Back to back years, this man has led his team, the Indiana Pacers. We're going back in time here. We're going okay. 2012 from 2013. He ain't the same player, though, so it's irrelevant, but I'll let you finish. He took, hey, he ain't fallen off much. And the only reason you can bring his numbers have fallen off is because he has other superstars on his team, like okay. Kawhi Leonard and Allegedly, Russell sure. Westbrook, right? Allegedly. <laughs> Were you going to tell me those two guys ain't superstars? No, go on. But as I'm saying, if you if he's gonna lead the team, this guy led Indiana Pacers to a conference finals two years back to back years. Even when his team came in at an eighth seed, this guy went off, averaging close to thirty points a game he against did. the Toronto Raptors. He did. Took him to a game seven, an eighth place team playing the number one place team to a game seven. I'm not. They didn't win. And that's fine. Because that Toronto Raptors team here. sucked in the playoffs, though. Hey. When you're and going, this, wasn't there. You're going into a playoffs. You're playing the number one team. Regardless of what you think of that team, they're the number one team in the East. Yeah, the best I'll, give him, I'll give them that credit. To have to have the mentality. For what what year was that? Seven, this was twenty. I'd say twenty fourteen. Twenty sixteen. This is not twenty fifteen or sixteen. Was it? I don't think it was twenty sixteen. Twenty sixteen was LeBron one. Yeah, but Raptors, the year that Raptors they finished went. first that year. I swear. Okay, so again, not that far. Four years ago? You're going <laughs> to yeah. tell me this guy fallen off? Four, You're going to tell me he fallen off. This guy is still so elite that guys like Kawhi Leonard are searching for him to put him on the team. They ain't looking for Siakam because they already had him and they left him. 
They're looking for <laughs> guys. Like, <laughs> they're looking for guys like Paul oh. George who can win your team championship. And I'm saying, if you need, a, if you have a team and you need leadership to be led to a Eastern Conference final, Western Conference final, or possibly the finals, you're gonna choose a guy like Paul George. And you're not going to go with the hope so, that a guy like Siakam can perform the way he's performed this season in the playoffs. So, a lot of your arguments there are corrupt. But I'll start with, uh, <laughs> I can't remember. They're, like, they're, they're in, in one ear, out the other. But the one I'll start with, <laughs> him, in the, him in the playoffs. Siakam last year did more in the playoffs than Paul George has ever done. This guy had 31 points in game one of the NBA finals. And you can make a case. What'd you say? Siakam had 31 in game one of the NBA Finals. He did last year in the playoffs more than Paul George has ever done in his playoff career. Has Paul George ever won a championship? Let me continue here, all right? Yeah, 31. There were games in that finals where Kawhi Leonard did not look his best, and Siakam picked up the slack. He could be relied upon and counted upon. (laughs) Name Name me those one or two games. Game one and game, I think it was four. Game one against Orlando? No, in the finals against Golden State. I said in the finals, you bro. Listen to the way, words. How much? How much points did Qua, uh, with Kawhi Leonard finish off with? In which game? In game one. I don't know, man. Because I'm looking. This is Siakam argument here. <laughs> yeah, talk about Siakam all Siakam, you want. Siakam led the, the other in piece. game. In game one, Siakam had a game high, thirty-one, yep. and he destroyed Draymond Green. Okay, number two. Look at what what they're doing this year, and you acknowledge Siakam has been more productive. 23.6 points per game compared to Paul George's 21. Okay? Yeah. Assists, they're both in the threes. They're not playmakers, really. Uh, rebound, 7.5 Pascal to 5.7 Paul George. That's a big d- – two extra rebounds can get you a win or a loss. Field goal percentage, 43 for Paul George, and then uh, 46 for Pascal Siakam. So he's more efficient, less wasted opportunities. All right? Three-point percentage, yeah. 36. I think Paul George – is better. Obviously, th- uh, at uh, 39.9, let's call it 40%, he is a better yeah. perimeter shooter. Now, to me, it's the versatility of Pascal Siakam and his skill set. All right? He can take you in the post if you're a smaller or a bigger guy. If you're a bigger guy on the outside, he's going to blow around you. Paul George does not have the post game that he has. His spin move is lethal. His playmaking is coming around. But for me, it comes to the mentality, the winner's mentality versus a loser's mentality. All right? <laughs> Siakam has always fought through adversity and grinded and from day one till now to get better. This guy has only been playing basketball for eight or nine years, I believe. He only started playing in either grade 11 or grade 12, then put his time in college. He's been with the Raptors now, I think, for four years. That's yeah. tremendous. Doing the most improved, being also this year, only been playing basketball for eight years. All right? PG, in the latter half of his career, He's realized he can't win as a number one option and has looked to make his job easier. What does he do? He realizes he can't win a, as a number one option in Indiana. Send me somewhere. I, I, I got to go somewhere where there's better players. Go to Oklahoma City. Can't make, it, can't make it work there. And what does he do? Doesn't even honor his damn contract. Pulls some dumbass BS maneuver to bully OKC into sending him to LA. So again, he can't win it. Oh, I need something easier for me. Let me go play with the best player or number two player in the world. Go pair yeah. me with Kawhi Leonard because I need all the help that I can get. Pascal Siakam, what has this guy done? NBA career doesn't, what start, is he done? NBA career doesn't start off the way he wants it to. Puts okay. in the work, wins the most improved player in the league war. Goes from averaging eight or nine points a game to 17. Then what does he do? Oh, okay, Kawhi's gone. I got to be the number one option now. What am I going to yeah. do? I'm going to elevate myself to averaging almost 24 points a game keep grinding, and take my team to now being the second seed in the Eastern Conference and gearing up for a playoff run. He has fought through, and I want the guy who fights and fights over the guy who constantly looks for the easier route in his life. And that's Pascal Siakam versus Paul George. Siakam is battle-tested, ready to grind. Paul George, I think he's soft. He's also got lots of injury problems. I think he's soft. Where did that come from? <laughs> By his mentality, he's always running away, looking for a way out of its current situation when it fails. And that's the problem with kids in today's NBA. The AAU Listen, system, sir. and it's rooted in their system. It's not just Paul George. There's lots of guys in the NBA who I got that issue with. All right? Bro. Listen. Okay. I'll let you finish. I'll let you finish. thing is, you take me off course here. But it's, <laughs> okay, okay. I want the guy who's grinded and is battle-tested, ready to fight for me, as opposed to Paul George. 
And let's not forget Paul George's injury issues. And we even said he did not look the same this year. Last year, you kept saying, don't give me excuses about his shoulder. If he's playing, he should be producing. And he wasn't producing in OKC. And now this year, same thing, injury issues. His numbers Last, were up in OKC. He, for the first half of the season. And then when I kept saying... Give Playoffs up, numbers? Was not they didn't that win good. games, but his numbers were pretty good. You kept saying, no, they, they were not that good. They were not that good. You're going back on your word now. I'm going to rewind and send you clips of previous episodes from last season. Yeah, I'll, I'll, let, and, I'll let you finish. And we even said earlier this season, he did not look the same with the Clippers. He looked yep. very passive, didn't want to be the guy to go get the buckets, and was not playing well. Something has changed in his mentality since he left Indiana to go to OKC, and it is not going to help you win. Pascal Siakam is a guy who will take the team on his back and do whatever he can to win, and he's improved in that every single game this season, and we've watched it right in front of our faces here in Toronto. And I'm taking him over Paul George. He's a fighter, man. Give me that guy on, his, on my team all day over Paul George. Okay. I'm just going to ask you a question. You want to know what Paul George averaged? I, okay, I'm not going to say it produced the wins because it didn't, but you can't just blame the wins on the one guy. This guy no, last year no, in the playoffs, sure. it was one series, one series, I understand, but he averaged 28 points. Fantastic. Are you telling me that he, that's not producing? When, when you said you needed this guy to produce, so who really wasn't producing? If he's averaging 28 and there's another, I'm not even going to say his name, I love him, and I don't want to go on. I don't, I don't want to. No, no, no. Him. Tell me how but you really who's feel. Really not, who's, not really, who's really not producing? <laughs> well, what was his shooting percentage? Don't lie to me. What was his field goal percentage in that series? Don't lie to me because I'm going to check it after this episode. <laughs> I swear to God. I'll come well, over then, to the poor credit. We, <laughs> we can have the argument. After. Okay, tell 43. me. 43. 43. Not bad. Not bad. Pretty good. Produce. And again, all right. when you were going, 43, you were going is, 43 is not him, elite. When you were going off with him leaving and looking for easier options, every time Siakam had an easier option last year. He had Kawhi Leonard on his team. You yeah, and, what like did he, and what did he? And what did he do with that opportunity? Was based on him, what did he do with that opportunity? He took he it by the balls and he did as much as he could to lift the opportunity and took advantage of it. Paul, Paul George, George has had six wins hey, team. Paul, Paul George and Russell Westbrook should have yeah. done more. Why not? Because those two Who are you blaming? Not, Who are you blaming? Both. Both. Okay, but they I both should have done their part. Way. No, I'd say more, more, from you. more people blame <laughs> Russell Westbrook. Yes. Yeah. So? But no, it's on both guys. Just can't say Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid. Uh, John yeah. Wall and Bradley Beal. It's on both guys to find a way to make it work. Pascal Siakam? Made it work fit seamlessly with Kawhi Leonard. Okay. This year was the number one. Let me and Kyle be the number one, number one, and number two scoring options. I'm gonna make okay. it work. So right. Siakam has done nothing but grinded to make his situations work, and Paul George on, has ran away. On his own, Paul George has took his team to two Eastern Conference Finals. <laughs> like Siakam has yet to yeah, do that. But so Addis, Addis, said, Addis, I'm not talking about. Off. I'm not talking about what player I want in 2013 or 2014. I'm talking about 2020. What off. player do I want? This is still an elite. And player. you also forget the injuries. I'm not taking that guy with shoulder problems, with back problems, knee problems, all the issues he has. If he goes and he misses half the season, what use is he to me? Okay, are we are we not basing this off this argument off of both guys healthy? I don't know. You want you can change that, but I'm saying which one I take for face value. Face value. Okay. Siakam versus Paul George. Listen. I'm taking everything into account here. I wish you could okay. see my hand movements right now. Oh, you, I wish you could see mine. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of can on the camera, but what I'm saying mine are all is down here. Paul George did everything he could for that Indiana Pacers team. He did not run away to an easier situation. He there was nothing left at Indiana. This guy came eighth into a playoffs and took the number one team seven games. After that, your team ain't building. There ain't nothing for you to do here. There's a reason that he left. He left, went to OKC, and again, a lot of people put the blame on Russ. You can put the blame on him too. But the, like you said, Siakam, you put uh, a superstar beside Siakam, and look what he did with it. You put Kawhi Leonard beside. You didn't just put a suit. You put Kawhi okay, the okay. top two players and we've in seen, the league. And we've seen Kawhi Leonard with Paul George, and Paul George is at a much more matured stage of his career than Pascal Siakam yeah. was last year yeah. for sure. Yes. So you could, I could make the very good argument that Siakam last year fit better with Kawhi Leonard than Paul George has this year. We've had What's conversations it? about Paul George huh? looking off this season. Okay, yeah, we have. But Clippers are still in there to win a championship this year. Yeah, because Kawhi Leonard the number two is, team is a bad, bad, bad guy. He's a bad, bad and, guy. 
and well, their, their whole too. surrounding cast, like that's a well built team. The Clippers have. Mm-hmm. It's not it just because Paul George showed up. With oh, just Kawhi <laughs> Leonard, with just Kawhi Leonard, they're probably top four in the West. Buddy, yeah, top four in the West. Now you put in Paul George, and they're top two. I don't really think they're top two in the standings. I'm pretty sure they are. If not, they're third and one game behind number two, which would probably be Denver, I guess. Oh yeah, they just moved into second. They're one game above Denver. Okay. So I'll give you that. I'm one. just basically. Uh, listen, wait, I've said my arguments. The people are gonna let us building. know in the comments. And I know. No, there's no they building. Will. There's no building. There's a team you're you have today, and you're that. trying to win. Yeah, who you yeah, take? Do you have another superstar in that team, or do you not? I don't know, man. Doesn't <laughs> matter. Doesn't matter. Huh? I've seen Siakam. If you don't, you're going with Paul George. Here's the thing. This year, right now, I've seen yeah. Siakam succeed without another superstar. I haven't yeah. seen Paul George do that. For bloody six I've years. Seen, I, I've seen five Raptors succeed without Siakam. That team is good. That's not just a Siakam but team. When, when have they succeeded without Siakam in recent memory? How many and games has he missed this season? Siakam? When has he been injured? A hmm? little this bit. This season? A little bit. Yeah, not but, that much. Um, he, he has not played close to 60 games. No, he, uh, he missed, I think, uh, I even, two uh, to, he missed two to three weeks. <laughs> it's going to take too long to check. He missed yeah. two to three weeks for and sure. A, and a Raptors team held up. Yeah, the, good team, they're bro. deep. They're deep. It's the Raptors huh? we're talking about. They're deep. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, but either uh, way, how like what's the likelihood that you of Siakam leading that team to a championship? Like it could happen, but the Lakers are a damn good team, <laughs> and the Bucks. Huh. The Clippers. Okay, fine. Are, okay, fine. For, for, screw a championship to the finals. What's the likelihood of them getting to the finals? I give them a good chance. I think they can take everybody, and then the, it's a battle against the Bucks. Against and, and can can they shut down Giannis? Yeah, I feel like you're 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 in a better position if you have Paul George on that team. I don't know. I don't you know, are, bro. Because I've seen him do it. I've seen him do can, it. I'm not but he can't. My he can't. Whole, he can't do a lot of the I've things seen. that Siakam does that makes the Raptors work. Him, be, yeah. his size and quickness combination together are, I even are, are, are lethal. And Paul George does not have the post game. Is Paul George. And Siakam's yeah, pretty good two-way as well. He is, but... And he's, he's Siakam young. Also has to get, Siakam has to get through freaking things. Giannis. Giannis is going to drop probably 30, 40 points on him. Yeah, no, yeah, but you can't go that way because we're trying to compare them to the same situations here. But Fair. here's Either the way. thing. Here's another also point in Siakam's favor. <laughs> I'm yeah. taking that guy for right now. If we don't win this year, I'd rather have Siakam long-term on my team than Paul George as well. So I'm building for right <laughs> yeah. now. But if I don't win with Siakam this year, I got more years of him left than Paul George, ta- whose body's going to break down. If you have a team right now that's close to freaking winning a championship, I'm going with freaking Paul George. Putting him, put, it, put him on my team right now over Siakam. I don't even think Paul George can shake guys like Siakam anymore. Can do what? He can't even shake defenders like Siakam shake? can at this point in, in his career. Bro, what the fuck? Siakam ain't shaking nobody. Are you dumb? Shaking. Spicy P? Bro. <laughs> he, bro. Made, he sent Only Draymond Green to the third Siakam round. The food that he, eats, bro. he sent Draymond Green to the third bloody row in the stands last year in the finals, game six. Before, and then that nice bank shot off the glass. His bro. spin move... Sends guys Don't even make me mention wild all Paul the time. George's fucking thing, bro. Are you kidding I'm saying me? right now, George. Paul George used to have a great first step, great handles. He slowed down a little bit, and the injuries play a part in that. I'm taking Pascal Siakam. Out, uh, End of my case. I'm not going on for three hours about this. <laughs> I know. My case enough. is my well, case let is the complete. viewers decide. I'm sure most people go with PG, but we'll see what they have I, to say. I don't think so. Most of our viewers <laughs> are probably in Toronto, so you're going to take this out. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right. We'll wrap here on that. Pascal Siakam over Paul George. I agree with Kendrick Perkins. He said Pascal Siakam as well. UFC 249 took place. You told me it was going to be on an island. Turns out all these events are going on in Jacksonville because oh, awesome. Dana White can't get anything done that he says he's going to. Uh, but that's besides the point. Did he not get the event done for you, Jay? Did he not get the event done for you? How many weeks after it was supposed to happen? I kept telling him, guys, in over his head, in over his head. And uh, it was so weird watching that event. One, Joe Rogan, uh, what's his face? Uh, Daniel Cormier. Daniel Cormier and the other guy sitting so yeah. far apart. 
Oh, Britney, Britney, Britney Palmer, the one ring girl. Only one ring girl. But I, I thought she was posting pictures with other ring girls. I was so confused. Then I see a, a video they show her. She's just sitting alone. She's doing all I'm the work. I'm surprised walk. they even did a ring girl. It's, like, it's, like, it's not needed. To. No, it's not. But it's like there's appeal to it, you know? I guess so. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, so no fans. So it's really weird, especially during the main event, which will kick yeah. off there. Because that fight was one of for the ages. One of the best fights I've seen in a long time. Justin Gaethje topples over Tony Ferguson. And he was the best fighter all night. Tony had his moments. Tell me, how did Justin Beat Gaethje, ass, how did Justin Gaethje make Tony Ferguson, who was on a 12-fight 12, 12 uh, win streak, I believe, look like yep. he was a tier below him? And Tony Ferguson, if he doesn't have that chin, he's knocked out in this, by the second round. Listen, the, that division is so weird right now because all that it's about is Styles make matchups. Khabib against Ferguson, it's a problem. Khabib against Gaethje, to me, it's a bit easier. For who? And, uh, for Khabib. Really? Yes. And I'm going to explain why. So, for, like, But Gaethje really has a to... wrestling background, too. And he's good at defending he takedowns. Does. He's been taken down. He's been taken down, though. Yeah, but he's good but at defending them, I hear, as well. He is. He is. He is. But listen... This is the worst. This was the possible worst matchup for Tony Ferguson. Tony Ferguson is the guy who pressures you, comes at you, makes you tired, keeps in your face the whole time, and you know just makes it a war. And then when you get to the ground, he's gonna submit you, right? Now that's gonna work great with Khabib because you can push Khabib to the push him back to the fence. Yeah, but you Khabib's take Khabib for a takedown. But you take take Khabib to the floor. Oh, you better be ready. Yeah, but but the thing is. He's gonna Khabib hug takes the shit him to the floor. Khabib takes him to the floor. You're getting elbows from the back. You're getting submissions thrown at you. Everything. Now, Gaethje's, Gaethje is a wrestler who uses his wrestling. Bro, I've never seen him use it. I've seen him in the old, older fights before he came to the UFC. But in the UFC, he hasn't even tried it. So, But his striking is, like, from the way he's improved in his just punches, his leg kicks have always been crazy. But, like, his punches is just insane. And, like, I get, like, as soon as this matchup was set up, I was like, this is the worst possible thing they could have done to Tony Ferguson. Because his way is what? to pressure guys and break them. Okay. A guy like Gaethje, so if that's you're not breaking. If that's Ferguson's style, why did he not yeah. try taking Gaethje down once in the whole five rounds? I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. That, that ain't Ferguson's style. Ferguson doesn't shoot for takedowns. Ferguson has yeah, pe but people shoot for takedowns and then he uses it jiu-jitsu. That's just common sense, too, though. But... He stood up the whole time and got his face beaten in. His legs looked broken. And not I once know. did he try and change something up to do a, to listen, do a different look at Gaethje. Nothing. This is what you got. This is how it seemed you like he was an it. untrained guy in that ring. This is how I got to explain it to you. I thought you would get it the best here. So, you're a great three-point shooter, right? Oh, I'm lethal. In the gym. Okay. You've never attempted a three in an NBA basketball game. Talk about Ben Simmons How like, here? Huh? No, no, but I'm saying, like, in the gym, you're lethal. I get it. I but get it, you've never it. attempted no. one. It's, it's just – it's almost like it doesn't come natural to you at that point anymore. Like, they're great. Both of those guys are great wrestlers. But yeah, but they've instead abandoned he... the wrestling for so long that it, it's not it – But instead, like, Ferguson they're... tried that half ass attempt at – I don't know what that move is called – the weird it's thing a, when he stand on the ground and it was like it was yeah, yeah. even Joe Rogan's like that was the worst attempt he could have done at it. So yeah, you try yeah. stuff way over the top instead of just a simple let me take this guy down, even just regain my breath back and leave my lean my weight on him. Yo, if I was Ferguson's coach, I would have thrown the towel in the fourth round. I like he was getting hit with shot styles like oh, he couldn't defend himself. I can't he like I can't even watch this anymore. This guy's just getting his ass beat at this point, right? Even yeah. like that at the end of the fight where he jabs Ferguson, he kind of shakes his head, he keeps shaking his head. That was one of the nastiest things I could have seen. Just because you know the reason he's shaking his head is because it's his probably brain is exploding at this point, bleeding. It's like, whoa, it's just where like, am I? What the, yeah, what's going on? Like, That's when they it called was, it. It was tough to watch at the end. It was just when every time that left hook came, Ferguson yeah. had no answer. Again, Ferguson's style – just it couldn't he couldn't do it to a guy like Gaethje. Gaethje oh. beat his ass so bad that like I feel like the world forgets that Ferguson dropped him in the third round and almost finished him at the end there. Yeah, with the uppercut, it it's forgotten because this guy got yeah. his ass beat so bad. 
I, if you I, look at them after the fight, when I was watching, was fight. when I was watching that fight, and I listened to Joe Rogan talk about the change in Gaethje, the maturation, right? Where yeah. he had so many times where he really hurt Ferguson, and instead of going in for the kill and leaving himself exposed, he would back off and say, All right, "I'm gonna just Wait, work yeah. it down." And yeah. that made me think of, you'd probably guess it, my favorite boxer, when he got his ass whooped against Ruiz, Anthony Joshua, because the reason he got his ass whooped is. It, he hurt Ruiz, tried going in for the kill, and Ruiz caught him. And then once he st- Joshua got dropped once, you could tell his legs yeah. and everything were gone. And Gaethje was like the same thing. He maybe and he learned. He's like, don't go in for that kill. So it's I don't know. You like to see that maturation in fighters and to learn the art of the sport as opposed to let me just try and kill a guy's face. Yeah, and this is a guy in Gaethje that like. This guy, even before he came to the UFC, his fighters, his hands are up, and he's just gonna take whatever you have and just give it back to you. Yeah, and like. I, the two losses he has in the UFC, he was coming back, winning those fights. Had a little, I guess, too much fun. Took too many he shots. Said, he and said, he I was having off. too much fun. Yeah. And you know what the funny thing was? In the, I think it was right at the end of the fourth round. They go to their corners. I don't know. I was watching it on Fight Pass. I don't know if you guys could hear what the corners were saying to them. Yeah, sometimes. But uh, he went to his corner and the joy in his face. He was like, <laughs> like laughing, looking at everyone. Yeah. Like, whoa, like, are you seeing this? Like, he was impressing himself. Yeah. And like I, I was, it was so like organic. I think you don't see that a lot. Guys, yeah. they're they're like they surprising themselves with like what they're doing. And he was so, so excited. And the coach said, Just "Slow it down and be patient." So I want to take this now to know. the future of the division. Yeah. Do you think? I know it's been hap- It's been scheduled five times. It's never happened. Do you think at this yeah. point Ferguson deserves now to f- even fight Khabib? Well, it's, it's heartbreaking because I've wanted to see this fight for so long, but. After that, I honestly... I don't think he deserves it. Two reasons I feel like we won't see that fight anymore. One, of course, he lost, so he has to build his way back up, right? Well, Ferguson, before the fight, said to a reporter, I don't think Habib deserves to fight me anymore. And now I think it's totally the other way around. I don't think Ferguson deserves to fight him. Here's the thing, though. After a beating like that, it like I've seen it numerous times. Fighters will never come back the same. And I'm not saying it's going to happen to Ferguson, but I'm just saying if it does possibly happen, we will not get that Khabib fight that we were waiting for. That was all, as it was like bittersweet to me watching that fight because as bad as it was for Ferguson, I was just thinking in my head, I'm like, fuck, man, now we're really not going to see Khabib versus Ferguson. Because I, yeah. to be honest, he's going to be sitting out for a while. I don't know how he's going to be looking when he comes back. Yeah. Especially after taking shots like that. So. I mean, naturally, the matchup should be Gaethje and Khabib because yeah. Khabib was the title holder, couldn't fight. So now Gaethje is the interim. And I like yeah. the way he threw that belt down because that belt ain't mean shit. What the hell is interim, right? But <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you what. Him, <laughs> I do, everybody wants to see, obviously, you know, Gaethje, Khabib, big fight. But Mr. Yeah. Conor McGregor has thrown himself back into the media circus. And I'll be honest, I want to see Conor McGregor take on Justin Gaethje because I think that's two guys – who just want to yep. slaughter their victims. And now, well, Gaethje <laughs> talked about, this. you don't do this to Connor. You don't talk about his mother. You don't talk about his family. <laughs> Gaethje, talked oh, about, Gaethje talked about Connor's son, and then Connor lost it on Twitter. So if you haven't seen these tweets, we'll just read a little bit of them. The, the one thing I didn't like is Actually, he said, I haven't he, seen these tweets first. He said, I love Tony, which I'm like, wait, Tony talks so much shit about McNuggets. Why do you love Tony? Uh, but he said, because they used to represent the him. Heart, uh, you got to read yeah. These represent my paradigm sports. But he said, uh, oh, fair it is Dustin and Tony next to Tony Hills. Who's Dustin? Who's he talking about? Dustin Poirier. Okay. Who so fought he's, Khabib he's, last for the title. Okay, so Connor says it should be Dustin and Tony next to Tony Hills if he does. Dustin will beat him also if changes are not made, uh, which they won't. Dustin, although game yeah. and in the mix, will be fed to the floor again. Couple wins here, there, then folded in half. Rinse and repeat. Dustin's career. <laughs> then he says, Justin, there is no danger in a man that hugs legs. We all know. Try and dance around what the real threat is here all you want. I'm going to fucking butcher you. Your teeth, I'm going to put them on a fucking <laughs> necklace. Speak on my skills as a father, you are fucking dead. Don't ever see you represent the great nation of the United States of America ever again. No true American would speak so highly of or allow a convicted member of a jihadi terror cell represent them. Never forget. You're a fucking blind fool, and I'm going to finish the job. 
Habib, you are an absolute embarrassment. Scurrying, hiding, rat as usual. As I have said many times, as has been seen many times, through the pain and glass, it was confirmed that what was always known. Damn, his English is terrible sometimes. No comment, lol. An embarrassment to real fighting. And then he says, after this division demolition job, it is 170 pounds. See you in July. Okay. I thought it was 170 pounds way earlier. I thought he was going to fight Jorge think, Masvidal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think he won a Masvidal fight, but I think what's gone down in this division, 155, he's like, I, I got to slap some motherfuckers around here. Here's the problem, though. He's left to wait. Because, okay, personally, I think that Conor McGregor is a terrible matchup for Justin Gaethje. If he's going in there to throw hands, you're throwing hands at the wrong guy. This guy that's is what totally I'm saying. Boxing, he was able to go in there with the best boxer of all time. That's, what I, that's why I want to see that. There. Gaethje wants to stand <laughs> yeah. up there, put Conor against him. I want to see these two go toe-to-toe. Now, I, know. now, I don't know who's got the better chin. I don't think Conor's chin is that great. We've seen him wounded. Gaethje took a couple shots from Ferguson, not big ones. The big shot he did take, he was shook up at the end of that third round problem, or second the round. Big shakes, the big shots that Justin Gaethje has taken, he's taken in his earlier. If you watch his earlier UFC, his first three fights in the UFC, it's brutal. Yeah. He took probably over 100 strikes. So how, how do you see that fight playing out? I don't know who would win. Can Con- With Conor and Jake Gaethje? Yeah, because here's the thing. If Gaethje is going the same Connor quality. Stops him, bro. Yeah, hey. Oh, yeah. Why, Why though? Do you think he's going to limit so Gaethje can't throw those? Because if Gaethje gets off the same shots he got on Ferguson, Connor's dead. But do you think Connor will limit him from getting those shots off? And how will he here's do a, that? Here's the thing, though. He, he has an easy way to beat Connor wrestle. Will he use his wrestling? I can guarantee you he won't wrestle Connor. Yeah. And if you're going to box with Connor and throw punches like you were, the only thing he does have on Connor is the leg kicks. But yeah. Connor moves so much that those yeah, leg kicks active. don't they, they can't even yeah they can't even come into work because you can't find the guy. Yeah. It's it's not a good matchup for him, man. If you're gonna throw hands with Connor McGregor, it's not the way to win. See, That's everybody everybody thinks Connor's taking a step back in quality. I don't buy that. It's just because you saw him do the boxing thing out of his element, you knew he was gonna lose, right? Uh, and then Boy Mayweather for fuck's yeah, sake. Yeah, and, like and then and then and then he goes to Khabib. Well again, Guy who hugs your legs, Connor can't fight that way. And then yeah. we finally see him back in the ring, and while well, he breaks Cowboy's uh, face with a shoulder, and it's done in 20 <laughs> seconds. So I think Connor's still got the quality fighting to him, and that's he's the fight. I, wait, bro. That's the fight I want to see. If he's waiting no for way, Gaethje, there's no way they're going. There's no way that they're going to do. Not going to be in July. No way. Anything, anything with Connor before they do Gaethje and Khabib. So, Connor because said, see you in July. If he's fighting in July, who is he fighting? Who? If, he, if he's fighting at lightweight, it's going to be uh, Dustin Poirier. If he's That's fighting at 170 pounds, it's Jorge Masvidal. But he keeps saying about this whole lightweight, so maybe he knows something we don't. So, I'm thinking maybe now, in July we're going to see Poirier. There's versus. also, which I sent to you, um, Instagram comments. Dana White, before this fight, reposted a message from Conor McGregor yeah, yeah. that Conor posted on his Twitter saying, good luck to all the fighters and stay healthy and all that. And Nate Diaz yeah. said something along the lines of, shut your effing mouth, you... you Surprise, bro. <laughs> yeah, something like that. And then Conor said, shut your damn face and sign the contract. It, could yeah. that be the fight he's referring to in July? Round no, no, three. No. no, no, they asked Dana White about that. He said, I have no idea what contract they're talking about. Neither of those guys have been offered a contract to fight each other. He thinks that they're just talking shit. I also don't Which I agree. I, think I also, I also don't believe half the stuff that comes out of Dana White's mouth. But the thing is, Nate he, Diaz is like, the, he's impossible to freaking get through a fight. Like, I love him, but like, bro, the amount of demands that he's going to make and like, he's yeah. going to want the money, he's going to want the everything. You know? He's an a hole. So whether I think, I don't think that fight's going to happen. Maybe if Diaz really wants to come back, because he did retire apparently after he fought Masvidal. Maybe he can come back and fight Connor, but I don't see that. Because well, well, what's the point? What's the point of doing that fight? It doesn't really move the needle in anyone's favor. If Connor wins, great. You're still in the same position you've been in. If he loses, that's detrimental to his career. Detrimental. A win doesn't really, doesn't really help him in move terms him anywhere, of elevating right? yeah, into so divisions. It's stupid to me, but like, all right, they want to do it. I'll, I'm going to pay to watch. So. To wrap up the UFC talk. Yep. First, Francis Nagano. I had to text you. I had to text you. I literally just put on the fight for the start of that fight. 
and 28 seconds later, I was like, my God, my jaw was bro. on the floor. Here, what a bro. beast. What a beast. He fought a, kick, he fought a pro kickboxer, bro. That guy is decorated in stand-up. And he knocked him out in 20 seconds. Where, where does he go from here? He's heavyweight, right? He's stuck again, bro. He fight that Daniel Cormier guy was commentating. Yeah, yeah I know Daniel Cormier. To, yeah, he's set to fight Stipe for the title, right? Yeah. And now that Stipe, he's a, also a full-time firefighter. He's saying that he can't even train during these times. So he's looking to fight September, maybe. And a guy like Francis Naganu, you like as as company for the UFC, you are like responsible to only give him fights where he the other person has a fighting chance. You cannot put him in there anymore with guys like that. That's so dangerous. You see, like he bounced that guy's head off the freaking floor before yeah, the ref could get Cormier, him. You're you know, saying, like you can't give him just these random fights anymore. It's either you, Stipe or Cormier. You cut off there, um, but you're saying Naganu's either got to fight. Stipe or Cormier. Yeah. I think I think I think it's dangerous for Cormier to go in at this time in his career and this age against a guy like Nagano. Yeah. Stipe, it we've is. seen him fight him. I think he can handle him. Like Cormier's a guy who like he's talked about he's considered retirement the last few fights. Yeah, he has one more fight, yeah. Right? I think it's bloody dangerous for him to go against Nagano, man. That could be lethal for him. It is, but it could be dangerous for Nagano too once he gets taken down. That's, that's, that's the only problem. Yeah, Nagano's not great takedown defense. So if Kwame can get on the ground, sure. But if Nagano catches him up top, uh, that's over. Because yeah. they asked Kwame, like, would you fight Nagano? He said, I would. But at the same time, don't complain when I go in there, hug his legs, take him down, and hold him down the whole time. And you guys are bored. Like, you yeah. know, it's, it kind of goes both ways. As dangerous right. as it is, it's dangerous both sides. All right. And uh, Mr. Henry Cejudo announces his retirement oh, yeah. after his win. What is his legacy? Best 135-pounder of all time, I think. Of all time. But what does that mean? <laughs> you know? The reason he – well, from what I've heard is he says he only fight if it's for millions at this point. Yeah. But giving someone who – like, that division, you, you will never gen- – like, you'll never – like, you'll never generate maybe that if money. a Conor McGregor comes around – but wow. it's not going to generate that much money. So they'll never pay a guy like him in the millions. So at this point, it was a good retirement. I agree. Like, cause he did the same thing with, he was a wrestler. He yeah, won yeah. the Olympic games and retired Olympic right after gold, that. Yeah. So he's kind of in the same situation here. You know, you won the title, defended it. Now I'm going to retire. Dana didn't seem too happy when he heard that. Of course not. Cause there's <laughs> that whole thing about the, that was his last fight in the contract. Yeah. So his next contract he was hoping would be for millions. But Dana White's probably like, yo, are you trying to freaking, you trying to get the money? Is that why you're retired? Yeah, probably. All right. Uh, anything else from 249 or looking forward? What, what I got, like, of course, the fights were great. Amazing. And I'm so happy I got some new content, new fights to watch. I was drooling at the mouth for these fights. But what it showed for me is it, sports can come back. It's safe. What nah. they did was they tested these guys every day. They found one fighter who had, like, they isolated them already. They found one fighter who had it, but he also had a fam- family member who had it as well before coming. Isolated him, get him out, boom. We tested, so it, it worked. You know, you're able to test these guys. You're able to find out who's sick, who's not, and make it safe. It's a lot more difficult in uh, team sports, though, which we'll get to in the next segment, which we're heading towards oh. now. So COVID-19 is uh, still shut down the sports world uh, as well as the rest of the world. But we're starting to see daylight. We just talked about the UFC event that went on in Jacksonville, no fans. You said it's shown that sports can come back in a safe manner. Now, it's obviously a lot different with team sports because you have to have a lot more testing. There's a lot more trainers and management. Everybody's got to be around and got to be tested. As well as for basketball, you have four officials. Hockey, you have four officials compared to one referee for uh, UFC. Now. We'll begin with the NBA. Yeah. First, the report came out from Mr. Adrian Wojnarowski saying that uh, the NBA Players Association had asked team reps to send out a text to um, the players on their team asking yes or no, would they like the season to resume? Now, a few hours later, Sham Sharania of The Athletic releases a statement from the NBA PA saying that they have not authorized any questioning, voting, or surveying of their players regarding return to play. So, I just wanted to start there because Wojnarowski has never been proven wrong, I think, in his career. 
Sham Sharani, Sham Sharani said that he is wrong. He's wrong. So do you think that Roach got it right potentially and the NBA PA is upset that he got it right and is using Sharania and the Athletic to just kind of kill that in the water because they're upset it got out? Yeah. Like, this is a tricky one, man. You never see Woj and Sharania going head-to-head. It's usually they're both reporting the same thing within minutes of each other, breaking the news. Here's the thing, though. At this point, I'm believing Woj. Like, he's been right so many times. I know. Shams is my guy. He is, but, like, listen. Brown boy. Like, you don't come out with something like that, saying that, without... Like, a guy like Woj, he's fact-checking. He's making sure what he's saying is correct. All that stuff. Like, he's not just chasing headlines at this point anymore. I've, question, knows, I've questioned his fact-checking in the past, though. I'll be honest. Have you been, has he been wrong? Uh, no, there's times where he's reported stuff, and I'm like, ooh, I don't know. He maybe report, I don't know. I feel like with breaking news, he's the guy to trust. Yeah. So if he's telling me this, I'm going I'm to I'm take it at value. And if someone's getting mad about it, I feel like it's because so of you think the him players kind of breaking the news. You think Sharania was... Uh, used here and that he's actually reporting fake news maybe <laughs> i guess, <laughs> I, guess I don't i don't want to you know downgrade any reporter because they're both tremendous at their job uh the reason why my eyebrow was raised towards Woj is that surveying seemed like a mood point i think almost every player wants to return i think the nba desperately wants to return because the nba really wants to see a lakers clippers western conference finals and wants to see a lakers or clippers uh championship yeah. so and i think the players all want to play who are all in the playoff position whether you ask guys I'm, I'm gonna, Celtics, i'm going to tell sixers. you earlier. Anyone so says to me no, you're that off. questioning <laughs> seemed kind of a mood point i think maybe perhaps some players were texting each other and maybe we'll just read it the wrong way but moving on from that lebron james had heard the whispers of some players don't want to play and, he, and execs and agents. And he's like, well, why? Everybody I've talked to wants to resume playing. So yeah. he hopped on a call with a bunch of the uh, biggest stars in the National Basketball Association. I uh, reported that LeBron, Kawhi Leonard, Kevin Durant, and uh, Chris Paul, Damian Lillard, Chris Giannis Paul, yeah. Antetokounmpo, Russell Westbrook, Steph Curry were all on this private call and they came to the conclusion that they all want to return to play. Yeah. Now, I started raising questions to you and I said, the Nets have said that no matter what happens, Kevin Durant's not coming back in the playoffs. So why would he be on this call when his opinion is irrelevant because he's not playing? That started making me think, maybe he is closer to returning to action than we thought. Because the original timetable was about a year, right? That's a, yeah. when, when you blow your Achilles. Well, when the playoffs resume, it'll be about a year. But there's no Kyrie Irving for sure. So do you think potentially that we, the Nets have been leading us on and that this shows Kevin Durant may return to the Brooklyn Nets in the playoffs. Yo. Or am I just a conspiracy theorist? Listen, you're a conspiracy theorist. Kyrie didn't want to answer LeBron's call. That's why. That's why Kevin Durant had to hop on, on this. No, but Kyrie wouldn't be on it either, in my opinion, because he's not playing either. So what's his opinion relevant for? Yeah, but you, you need a representative off the team. Look at the guys you need. Okay. But that wasn't everybody on every team. There's nobody on the Raptors. Kyle Lowry wasn't on that call. It wasn't oh, a guy for... call. Oh. Oh, they said Lowry was on there. No, Larry was is the team rep for the Raptors. So if somebody was sending out texts for the Raptors, it would have been Kyle Larry. But he wasn't on this call. So not the from every team. It's just the biggest so, stars in the game. But why? why if I'm if I'm LeBron James, Kawhi Leonard, I'm not putting KD on that call because what I care for you, what he has to say. Maybe they're. I'm thinking maybe it's because they're with the team. So they're it's just like being nice. The only guy that I have on on Brooklyn Nets. Yeah, it's kind of like oh, I'm friends with KD. Let me call him, get his take too. And see, what, is, see what like, Nets players are thinking? If it's a fact that KD's coming back from the postseason, bro, like, what? That would change everything. What it I don't care what anyone... How much... How much so, let's get there. Yeah. How much would it change? No Kyrie. We saw the Brooklyn Nets with Kyrie, no KD. They're, yeah. a little, they're about the same as last year, maybe a little bit better, right? I'll, I'll check right now what's standing there, and I think they're on the sixth seed. So, if you take out... Brooklyn's eighth, I think. Seventh. 30 and 34, below 500. So you take out Kyrie Irving, obviously Kevin Durant is a better player. Now, when we saw Kevin Durant return in the playoffs against the Raptors, he'd only missed a few weeks. Now he's coming off missing a year. How elite do you, he's not coming back like MJ. How elite do you think he would be? And how does that propel Brooklyn? First round, they're matching up against the Raptors if we were to start playoffs right now. If you think that KD can't come back right now, 
No, I think he'd be good, but the, how, no, how like, good would he be? And I'm saying compete to, what's it called, make it out of the East? You're crazy. He's gonna. You're in for a rude awakening, bro. If this, really? you know how elite KD is. But he's never done it alone. Huh? Never, never. He hasn't been able to do it with just Westbrook. Bro, KD can drop. If he was a, he drops with superstars thirty a game. Alone, he's dropping sixty. Bro, this is Kevin Durant we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, but we, we've, we've talked about, about how superstars alone, when they take it upon themselves, and then they go drop the 50, 60, and the rest of your team's not in the game. And the other team is going like a well-oiled a machine. They're a good team. But if he's going to get 50 or 60, because that's the only way they're going to beat the Raptors in the first round, and the Raptors are, you know, moving their ball and chugging along, Bro. is that going to be enough? Can he I'm do real saying, damage? Listen, Depending on the matchup. If you're, if you're a Raptors fan, I'm a little, praying. I'd be nervous. You're I'd be praying. nervous. You're praying that KD ain't coming so, back. So, let's um, say, hold up like, for a second here. Yeah. So they're thirty and thirty-four. Uh even if the, even if regular season comes back, they're I doubt it will. They're eight games back of Philly to move yeah. into the sixth seed. So there's not going to be enough games really, unless there's ten games and Philly doesn't win any of them. Brooklyn Wait, but hold will finish up. in the seventh seed. How far? Oh, okay, I guess yeah. What about Boston? And aren't they uh, third? Boston's third. But so how close are they to the Raptors? Can they take our second spot if KD comes back? <laughs> They're three points back of the Raptors. Three games back, sorry. Three Fuck. games back. That's tough, too. Bro, so, this is... We're not talking likely, about... He's, he's playing the Raptors. An all-star. We're talking about a superstar. Who has so, so, what, two titles? How do you, how do you see that? Tell the people. How do you see that series playing out? Get your bias out of there. You're saying he's so elite, he's coming back. He can will a team on one man. Is he yep. enough to beat the Toronto Raptors? Listen, the Raptors, Raptors, and those guys. he's probably going to have a problem with. Because we're going to have guys that we can put to defend on him, right? Siakam will do an okay job. Same with OG. Siakam, yeah. OG can do a good job, too. We can even put Ibaka if you want on him to add some height. Yeah. Well, he's blown by Ibaka, let's be real. <laughs> yeah. If you keep, keep him keep him around the area. <laughs> but, bro, this is, this is KD, a guy who can just run up the court <sighs> Pull up three every single play, and sixty percent of the time it's going in. Like it, like he's at uh, the we, stature we, that a healthy KD to me is a top two player in the league. Yeah, top two, top three for sure. And yeah. we know maybe he, you can put Kawhi in there. He learned how to win in Golden State, and you know kind of what and, and it he has, he has and plays. Yeah. And he was a big contributor. And hit those big buckets over LeBron James in both finals. Yeah, I just think and, alone if he was playing Boston. They got talent. He's not alone, but, though. But they, but, no, He's I, not alone. All right. Let me – Brooklyn's a good team. <laughs> but really, I'm really sorry, if they were that good, with Kyrie, they'd be higher than the seventh seed. All right. Jared Allen, Wilson Chandler, he's going to have some good moments. Okay? Yeah. Um, who else we got DeAndre here? DeAndre Jordan. DeAndre Jordan, way past his prime. He, he yeah, might – get he, he, he could give you a like 10 and 10. Point. He could give you a yeah. 10 and 10. Joe Harris, elite shooter. Yep. Karis LeVert and Spencer Makes Dinwiddie. Even more and Garrett, you, you double team KD, you better not be leaving guys like Joe Harris open. No, so that's what I'm saying. Their team, it'd be KD, you got Dinwiddie, Could Joe Harris, problem, Garrett Temper, Temple, and LeVert. So you got four decent players there. Yeah. Raptors starting five, position for position, their players, I would say, are better than Brooklyn's. Of course, yeah. I'm still giving Toronto that edge, but that's probably a seven-game nail-biter. That's a nail biter, hundred percent. Because of course, of we're all, we're, he's human. He's gonna come back freaking a little bit rusty. But here's the thing: don't he's shooting. Think he's gonna be rusty, rusty. This guy, he's still an out. As much as he is human, he's an outlier too. He's yeah. a, as, as we said, a healthy KD is a possible top two player in the league. So here's this the, guy can easily come back, rent and just take his team to Eastern Conference Finals or even the finals. Because here's the here's the thing for me though. It's just like when, when Zion came back and I said he had that first game shooting explosion because he'd only been working on shooting because he couldn't run. Same with yeah. KD when he came back that game against the Raptors after missing a few weeks with a calf injury. While he couldn't do much cutting or exploding to the basket, so he's just working on shooting. So what did yeah. he do? He came out, he banged three threes. He had like 12 points in 11 minutes on three three-pointers. Yeah. His shooting is still going to be there when he comes back. It's going to be the explosiveness to the basket, shooting off the dribble, a fadeaway, stuff like that that might be a little bit rusty. 
But man, if you leave him open as a spot up shooter, this guy is gonna be lethal. There's, the only thing that I feel is gonna be rusty for him and his is defense. Gonna be competitive play, right? Because, bro, he has an Achilles. He had an Achilles tear. I don't. I'm not like I don't know what the recovery time is for that. About a year. It's a, huh? It's about, about a year. But eight to like twelve months. Off the like eight months off surgery. Yeah, when you have the surgery, it's like eight to twelve months, depending how it goes. Okay. He's had uh, how long now? Probably like he's, he's five, had. Lo- I'd say about more, eight months. No, he's had more than that because that happened uh, late June. So oh yeah, he's had like ten. July. Yeah, yeah. So he's almost had a year. You t- you think this guy's not been practicing? He's been throwing up shots. He's been working on his game. He's been, it's not working on his game mentally. You know, like if he if he does come back, all I know is he's in a place that he thinks he can come back and make a difference. And yeah. if he if he thinks like that, that's a that's dangerous. Yeah. So, now, do you call think? Call the snake all you want. Maybe I think the Raptors. The court. I think against the Raptors, he's in tough. Do you think he could take down? Boston, Milwaukee. Boston, I think so. Milwaukee, I'm not too sure. I, I go, I go the other way. I think he has more of a chance with a team like Milwaukee than a team like Boston. Why do you say that? Because who's really going to be guarding him on Milwaukee? Giannis. You yeah, can put Giannis. guys. Giannis. Yeah, but on the perimeter. Uh, KD is quicker, oh, but again, warrior. how quick? How much is KD going to trust the Achilles, and how explosive is he going to be, going off the dribble? That's when you get problems if Giannis, yeah, yeah. if Giannis is guarding him, right? That's the issue. Yeah. So, yeah, is he going to have that same explosiveness and same willingness? Any injury you come back from, you're naturally going to be worried about a little bit. You're not going to trust it the yeah, same. Of course. Hey, there's gonna my be first, my there first ball hockey game back with my knee. You know, physiotherapist says, yeah, you're fine. Wear your base. You're good to go. I was a little nervous. But, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's, all, it's in your head. That's what I'm saying. Ho- hopefully, if he does come back, he's taking this time to work on his game mentally and, of course, physically too. Yeah. But if he has, it's KD, man. I'm not going to doubt KD. He can easily take him to the finals. Yeah, he'll do damage. I I don't think he uh, – no. I don't think he gets out of the East. Hmm? I would put East. my money on him not getting out of the East. I don't know if he gets out of the East, but he, he gets close to it, I think. If he does that, he's getting by Toronto. So, let's see. Huh? That's, that's what I'm saying. I'm hoping that he doesn't come back and he ain't yeah. know, KD. All right. Well, wrap up with uh, the NHL's current uh, situation. Uh, yep. It was reported a few days ago that they are contemplating 16-team playoff formats, 20-team playoff formats, and a 2014 playoff format is gaining ground amongst uh, ownership, management, and, and league personnel. The way that would work is teams are ranked based off point percentage. The top eight teams would get a bye. And the remaining 16 teams would participate in a play-in tournament. And then I assume you'd be left with eight teams. And then you'd yeah. have your traditional eight-team conference playoffs in each conference. And uh, you'd proceed to your best of four, uh, seven series. Do you like that for hockey? And do you like that for basketball? Do you think that works? I, you kind of touched on this issue before. Those teams that those eight teams that are going to be sitting out, they're going to miss out on some competitive play. Yeah, right? I would not want that by. Would not want that by. I, I'm. You're gonna have to ask the players on this because, like, if I'm playing, I'm not. I don't want to buy. You know, like I'm just sat out how long now, and you're gonna just throw me in with these guys who are ready. Like, it, it, especially at that level, it's hard to just you know go from yeah. zero to. Playing you, you get your bye, and the other t- the team who you end up playing against in the quarterfinals just went through, yeah. say, a, a, well, three or, yeah. a three or five game play in where they were fighting yeah. for their lives every match, and they're and rolling. The rest, the they're rest intense. Is yeah. yeah, and you still have to deal with all that rust and get your legs back. So I don't like that. And then there was a comment uh, Sidney Crosby was on Dreger Cafe with Darren Dreger on TSN, and yeah. uh, he said, Look. I don't care how they bring us back, but it's got to maintain the integrity of the Stanley Cup. The Stanley Cup has been along for, around for 100 years, and it has to be the same type of grind that the NHL playoffs is. It's got to be four series that are best of seven games. It's got to have the same standard and same intensity. Otherwise, it, it, he said it can't feel like a cheap win. You can't just have an NCAA March Madness style bracket where you're playing one game series. He said, I would not want to participate in that. So I think that's going to be the biggest key no matter how – 
how these leagues come back. Yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to have this asterisk asterisk talk I, about these championships. Are they going to mean as much? Saying, yeah. Come back, have as just as intense. You can change the format, but it's got to be just as intense and as just much of a grind. So the players are dead by the time they win. So you see Kawhi Leonard coming to the interview with Rachel Nichols and Kyle limping, Larry, yeah. limping and saying, "I'm so happy I can limp now." Openly, we have no more games left. My body is dead. I want to see that. I want to hear about the NHL reports. But Chiefs Bridgeron was playing through a punctured lung. Uh, this guy was playing with a broken jaw. This guy's yeah, uh, Zach Hyman that? was playing on a torn ACL for the Leafs in the playoffs last year. I want to hear these stories. I want to hear the battle and the war these guys went through. Who and was that on Boston again that had a broken jaw kept playing? Zdeno Chara. That's so, yeah, Chara. Well, that's so impressive. I don't know if that's no. <laughs> impressive or Patrice Bergeron playing with a punctured lung. Like, you, you couldn't punctured breathe. Punctured lungs. <laughs> when, they, when they won the Stanley Cup, I think, oh, what was it, when they won? Uh, 2011? Played through a punctured lung. How the fuck do you do that? Hockey players, man. That's how. That's madness, bro. Google it. Like a ventilator? <laughs> oxygen tank <laughs> for the back? periods. <laughs> yeah, like Up what? Up and <laughs> Yeah, so that... I don't know if you have any more thoughts. I just... I want to see that same intensity going on in the playoffs. I, I agree time. with that. Like, you can't... Because if you do change the play, playoff format or, like, the intensity of it anyway, again, as you said, there's going to be... Whoever wins it that year is not going to be – is it a true win? You know, that's, that's going to be the question. It's going to be like, yeah. oh, yeah, they won a championship in 2020, but I don't want that, you know? Yeah, I want it to be that you if come you're back. you finish the season off, finish it like you would. Yeah, I want it to come back with intensity. And then this chip, I think, will mean even more than any other chip because that means your team – I forget who was talking about it. An NBA uh, former player said it means your team was the most battle-tested – you had two or three months with no communication, barely, and you kept the chemistry. Yeah. You refound the chemistry and the compete level. I think it would mean more, not less. It'd be more impressive. I, I agree. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, NBA, uh, Adam Silver said the NBA is hoping to outline their plan in the next two to four weeks. So around that horizon. Such a stretch. They, they You're going to have like a plan in two I think if you wait four weeks buddy you're pushing it you know like when the hell is this thing gonna start I agree and now you're heading into June without a plan you know so practice what? facilities open May 8th and uh, here yeah. in Ontario Doug Ford and Mayor John Tory in Toronto allowed the Raptors open the facility but I haven't heard anything about players using their facilities I've heard I've heard uh, I heard I heard of uh, Philly uh, Simmons and uh, Phil, no, club, but right? Philly actually had been breaking the rules and had been allowing Simmons and players to use the facility the whole time. Oh, shit. Okay, well, yeah, somehow, but somehow it. that's flown under the radar. They said Ben Simmons and players have been using the facility the whole time, and nobody's like, "Wow, that's totally like not following protocols." They, they, but, they really want to win a chip, bro. <laughs> but Pen I will say Pennsylvania has had a very low number of cases compared to the rest of North America. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. And there's still lots to... I feel like if players are breaking laws in freaking Philly and going to practice, once they're open in Toronto and stuff, they might not be talking about it, but I'm telling you, these players are practicing. Well, the thing is, that all the Raptors players have gone back home. Kyle Lavi flew back to Philadelphia. You know, like, Pascal Siakam <laughs> obviously stayed in Toronto, but a lot of guys went back to the city. So now the problem becomes they have to wait. If I fly in now, I have to quarantine myself for two weeks. Am I even allowed in the practice facility? Justin Trudeau said if the NHL hosts games in, in Canada, the players have to quarantine for two weeks. Is it going to be the same yeah. with these Raptors guys coming in just to practice? Leafs players and Blue Jays players have said they're not coming into Toronto. Wait, so they know exactly what happens. Larry flew back to Philly? All, all the players went back. All the players went back to their home cities from all the teams. Yeah. All they, right. al they allowed that after two or three weeks of, of uh, quarantine. Once they passed their regular no, but I'm saying days, like they yeah. were allowed to go back to their home cities. Okay, I guess to see family and stuff. But maybe, maybe a lot of you stayed in Toronto, but I'm, I'm saying he most likely went back to Philly. Because I was going to say, I feel like that makes, especially with uh, the Toronto Raptors, that makes it so difficult at that point. That, that's what wherever I'm you go, you're quarantined for two weeks. So to come back in. But what? Yeah. That's hard though, because we're. So let's say the NBA comes back. You got to have a facility to play these, like, or an area to play these games, but you can't have the East and West play these games at the same time. So, I don't know. Well, I don't know. The more I talk about it, the more I think it's not going to come back. But then the more I read reports, the more I think it's going to come back. Well, Florida like, governor, just before we went on, we started recording, got a notification on my phone, the Florida governor has told each state, uh, sorry, each yeah. um, commissioner that we will find space within our state to host your leagues. 
this is why I think it's more going to be they go somewhere like Disneyland that can build, has space for all these courts and has all the hotel mm-hmm. rooms. You bring the yeah. whole league there and everybody quarantines together. So if yeah, you like infect somebody, it's you're infecting the league, nobody else, and your own team. And each so team's kind of got their own there. area. Yeah, each team gets a hotel. You run your training camp there. And the players actually never return. Raptors players never return to Toronto until the following season. Memphis Grizzlies players never go back to Memphis, etc. You're playing for a city, but you're not playing from that city. That, that's what it's going to have to come down to. And well, yeah, the Eric, the Eric, NHL Eric, is going to be the same. <laughs> NHL is going to be the same thing. If it's, they're going to have their four hub cities, I think. And if it's not in Toronto, Toronto Maple Leafs players will never return to Toronto unless they win the championship and it's to have our parade. Yeah. But how funny would it be? The Maple Leafs have not won a cup, you know, like over 50 years. Yeah. If, they, if they win this year and we can't even have a parade. <laughs> I don't think they'll win. They're not good enough. I didn't even, could you I imagine? I, I didn't could you imagine that? Celebration parade. Yeah. They're gonna do a parade regardless. If, if they're not gonna make one for us, we we do one anyways. Toronto will be on the streets if if Leafs were to win the championship. Hundred. I was I was debating with a friend the other day who was asking me. Uh, just quickly before we wrap up here, he said, "Do you think Toronto will become a basketball city in the next 10, 20 years?" I said, "Well, it's contingent on a couple things." And we had the discussion, but I said, "Look how crazy that Raptors parade was. If you thought that was nuts." Wait until the Leafs even made like the second or third round. And if they won a chip, the city would burn down and the parade would be 10 million and they wouldn't even be able to move the damn bus through the streets. A six hour parade that the Raptors had would take three days for the Leafs. I guess. But look, the Raptors is different as the first, you know? Never yeah. the same as the first. Dude. Well, I guess it's kind of the first two with the Leafs because it's been so long. <laughs> the Leafs have been an utter embarrassment for our entire lives and the last Stanley Cup was 1967 so if you think we're not raging if they win you're you're misunderstood my friend <laughs> actually yeah, we probably 19, 1967 you'd be going nuts I, but that, that's what I mean it's so long ago that it feels like just the, the first. first it would feel yeah. like yeah the first it would be yeah. first in our lifetime yeah. all right any closing statements on anything not really. I don't know. I'm excited to see how sports are going to come back. But, you know, like as bad as this whole thing is, it's kind of like not entertaining, but kind of like interesting to see how they're going to work through. <laughs> not entertaining. Like this, wrong word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. See interesting. how they're going to work through something like this. All right. Thanks Especially for watching. do that whole Disney World shit. That's not a bit. Well, they're taking their families with them. Families get to ride the rides in between games, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I want to go to Disney World. Tell your dad to make the NBA. You'll be there. All right. Thanks for watching. For Addis Kuchkovich, I'm Jay Boyle. We're out of the mix.